Support for November 17th, Finding Strength After the Storm, is provided in part by the following. Like many families, we lost our home in the tornado on November 17th. We've chosen to rebuild in Washington, a community that we love. I'm proud of my employer, Caterpillar, for its ongoing commitment to make Washington strong. Caterpillar is pleased to sponsor this program on public television. For nearly 80 years, CEFQ has been proud to call Central Illinois home. CEFQ members are your friends and neighbors, so when a tornado devastated our community last November, CEFQ was there to help members rebuild. Because together, we're better. A local expert who knows your unique situation makes all the difference. A country financial representative is nearby and ready to help with auto, home, life, health, and business insurance. Protect what matters most. The November 17th tornadoes shredded homes and lives. The American Red Cross immediately initiated a large-scale disaster relief effort in order to provide hope and comfort. And even as its emergency relief was occurring, the Red Cross began to help in the long recovery process that continues today. Four generations of Steegers, proud to be a part of the spirit of rebuilding and rebirth, and proud to provide affordable, fine furniture to Central Illinois. Here's to the future. From all of us at Steegers Furniture, It was unusually warm for a November Sunday across central Illinois. Families went about their normal morning routines, with many attending local churches. But just after 11 a.m., time came to a standstill. Quiet conditions yielded to threatening skies, which spawned a dozen twisters in Illinois, a record for that time of year. Attention all officers, there was a report, Tesla County just called over southeast Tesla County near Washington, but on the file, looks like it's coming down. Twenty-eight copy, twenty-eight copy. Just heard from Esther, there is a tornado on the ground. Two of those tornadoes caused massive damage in Tazewell County. One funnel cloud tore through Pekin. But it was a second, more powerful twister, with winds of 190 miles per hour, that began near Springfield and Muller Roads in East Peoria that caused the most harm. The half-mile-wide vortex raced 46 miles in just 45 minutes, leaving a huge scar through the city of Washington where more than 1,100 homes and businesses were destroyed or damaged. The rubble that was left behind no longer resembled what had been the Devonshire subdivision, Georgetown Common Apartments, and nearby businesses after the tornadic winds pushed through town. Many families were left with nothing more than memories as their households were literally flattened. It was pitch black. Um, cracking and breaking and just that awful sound. And I heard what sounded like a train. This was not just another thunderstorm. This was a real tornado. There were people I've never met before that came over to help. Family members for years had told Bob Montgomery of a tornado that had demolished their farm buildings. April 19th of 1941, a tornado came through this area. Uh, took the other side, not this side of, uh, Maine. Uh, of Maine, but took the other side uh, where the, uh, the Smith Farmstead is and took everything but the house. His, his grandma kept a daily diary. She wrote a note and it said, 8, 10 p.m. got hit by a tornado, took everything except the house. That was an early evening spring tornado, the most common time of year and day for a tornado in Illinois. It's much rarer to have morning tornadoes in November, yet two twisters roared across Tazewell County on an exceptionally warm day, taking the house that had stood those intervening 72 years. Well, the worst EF4 tornado in November in the history of Illinois uh, was here. The tornado first started to intensify near the WEEK television studio in East Peoria. 
Meteorologists Chuck Collins and Sandy Gallant were advising viewers of the threat when they had to take their own advice and seek shelter. Get to your basement, get to the centermost portion of your home and take cover. I am hearing things right now, Chuck. Yes. I think we, um, we may need to take shelter right yes. now ourselves. We do. We need to go off we the do. air. Yeah. We will be back when we can. Right, we'll be right back. The storm was strong enough to lift an East Peoria police cruiser up off Muller Road. Officer Zook, he was out watching the tornado, you know, give, calling it back in to, to dispatch. And uh, he actually drove in, a uh, very uh, brave man, and then picked him up and put him back down. It left a scarred swath as it crossed South School Street, sparing a group of miniature ponies on the farm of Shirley Upchurch. It reached full strength as it tore up Georgetown Common Apartments. Renner's applications for assistance were delayed because FEMA was not allowed to inspect the structure for the extent of damage due to liability issues. They had a structural engineer do a report and we sent that to our uh, folks in Washington. They were able to turn that around and give us a solution and the solution that they came up with was they determined that those structures had been destroyed. If a structure is deemed destroyed, they are no longer need, in need of inspection. Some residents eventually were allowed to return to their apartments accompanied by a firefighter. I figured at the very least that would give that added assurance that as they walk up together with that fireman to that front door, that the fireman could do one last assessment of the building prior to letting the person in. The Georgetown Common property remains vacant. The funnel cloud then roared through the Hillcrest Golf Center. As the twister crossed Route 24, it slammed directly into Advance Auto Parts with three employees inside. I had an assistant uh, manager on duty, John Walker, who was here, and he had, had two other team members that were here. Um, John was over by the window to the right of the building, saw the tornado over, the left, over his left shoulder. When I saw it, it was just coming out of the street. So I grabbed my crew and ran to the bathroom and we had maybe five seconds, and it was over. But the building was down in less than 10 seconds. Right away, my boss and I got on the task of finding uh, alternate sites for my team. Uh, within a few days, everybody was up and working at other locations. Every employee except Roger Giles. He was trying to avoid the tornado in his kitchen when the tornado took his house and him. His boss subsequently gave purpose to Roger's long hospital stay. While you're laying there, you're, you're like your hips broke and your legs are broke. You don't know how good you're gonna walk or whether you'll be able to perform, you know, your job that you had. And then when he comes up and tells you that just take as much time as you need and we'll be there and you'll always have a place to come back to so you can go back to work the day they say you can go. Well, that's great because that's one less thing you gotta worry about. After decimating the auto parts store and a few other businesses, the storm was at its maximum strength, leveling neighborhood after neighborhood before reaching farmland on the Montgomery's property. The Montgomery house, machine shed, and barn were among the 1,108 homes in its path through Washington. But it wasn't the structural loss that the Montgomery's mourned most. We own 75 acres right here, uh, next to the, directly next to the subdivision. And when we looked at it, I mean, you could not fathom what was in the field. It was utility poles, it was all kinds of wood, all kinds of metal. Uh, we had ceiling fans, we had motors. Every time I go in the field, I fill my pockets with nails uh, because that's what ruins the tractors and the planters. The Montgomery's came home from church after the storm. For Dustin and Kirsten Essig, they were coming home in the midst of the storm. We um, followed the tornado probably parallel for about a mile before we lost sight of it, um, just getting back to our home. And we were able to make it back actually um, to our street, but we were not able to turn down our street. We were still driving forward. I think at that point we were just basically trying to get out of the path of the tornado. Basically as high as you could see, there was debris above us. Uh, things were hitting the car. Uh, my son Oliver, who was in the vehicle with us, his window was actually smashed out first. So at that point, we knew that we were in, in pretty big, big trouble, we were in a bad place. Just blocks away, 
Their three other children, 11-year-old Winston and two five-year-old twins, were home in the basement. My brother Hudson said, my ears hurt, and I was like, what? And then I threw the blanket and some foam blocks over our head, and then the tornado went over, and I got out, and I was like, I called my mom and my dad, and then they didn't answer because the, the lines were down. And so I ran out, and I saw this car, just like half of a car, just sitting right there in our basement. And I was like, uh, this might not be so good. My door was uh, the only exit, so we were able to get out of the vehicle. And the second I got out of the vehicle, my mind obviously went back to my children. And just, you know, I was just trying to figure out how to get back home. And we were actually able to see straight through and see that our house was absolutely gone, along with the rest of the homes on our street. Your first thought at that point? That my three children were gone. There's no way you could see that amount of devastation and think that people were going to be okay. The parents hurriedly clambered through the rubble before reaching the curbside of what was once their home to find an unexpected joy. Winston was at the top of the stairs, and as soon as I hit the end of the driveway, I saw the twins' little blonde heads coming up the stairs. I came up, and my mom, my dad, and my brother were all just standing at the bottom of the driveway. Like, they had mud all over them, and like, uh, my dad had like scrapes all on his back and like they had their hair was soaked and like their clothes were soaked and like everything was just like messed up and at the same time we were just like happy to be there and we were just like all like hugging and crying. But as the reality of recovery set in, Winston's stoic bravery succumbed to emotional fears. I couldn't sleep at night and I was even scared to sleep on the main floor and then it was just like a big problem for me and I wouldn't want to go to sleep. I was like, there's going to be another tornado. There's going to be another tornado. I guess one of my lingering memories is, is just seeing our, our White House with that, you know, mammoth storm directly behind our house, just getting ready to barrel it down. And so it's just kind of a hard image to, to you know, erase from your memory. So I think for us, it's just best just to kind of move forward and, and just start start fresh. But I'm glad to be not rebuilding in the same area. The Essigs aren't the only family to start anew. 72 lots are for sale in the affected areas for a variety of reasons. The second Tazewell County Twister touched down in three separate neighborhoods in Pekin. It kind of skipped over 8th Street and went into an older area of town, uh, probably built in the late 50s. Um, went through two streets there and then skipped over into Marigold Estates and hit a street in Marigold Estates. Unbelievably missed a trailer park. It missed um, a Casey's general store with gas station pumps, but it hit right behind that. The Pekin tornado wasn't as powerful as the one in Washington, but it still had the strength to leave mental scars. Like the Essex, Taylor Lamberson and Nick Rogie were caught in their car just outside her parents' house in Marigold Estates. I felt the car being picked up. Yeah. And we were, you know, slammed back down. We were moved a couple feet and one just, of my windows shattered. Just the constant feel of the car shaking. Yeah. And you think any moment this can flip over. As we raise up and open our eyes, there's insulation all over the car all over the dash, all over the back seat. Mm -hmm. Our back window's broken because we heard it break. I see the garage, it was kind of caved in. And we looked to our right and the house next door was gone. With Nick and Taylor outside, her sister was only feet away inside the house. When the wind subsided, Brooke Brotherton stepped from the safety of the basement. Well, we kind of went outside. Uh, talked to the neighbors, making sure everyone was okay. And then I went inside, just see what else happened. And I walked down the hallway and my door was shut, glass. I opened it and um, my room was destroyed. In the months following, the sisters sifted through memorabilia as well as the mental phase of recovery. I know I had a lot of nightmares of tornadoes. Um, I was having a lot of flashbacks of the day. I could remember every detail minute by minute. 
I had a lot of nightmares um, throughout the months, um, flashbacks, a lot of flashbacks, and I went to counseling for it. There is a, a percent that are going to have the post-traumatic stress, um, but what we learned more is that uh, a higher incident of anxiety and depression associated with the disaster because reality setting in now. Some individuals may even experience that so significantly that they might have panic attacks. And so during that time, to do slow, deep breathing to help calm the body down as well as the mind. The Heart of Illinois United Way compiled a new booklet with suggested techniques to manage one's emotions. It addresses the calming and coping strategies that people need immediately after and short and long term down the road recovery skills for their emotional health. So our goal was what can we do to restore emotional health and bring back hope to communities. Hope also can be found at Tri-County Long-Term Recovery, a one-stop shop of sorts to help families fulfill multiple needs without visiting a myriad of organizations. Long-term recovery really allows that to happen by a victim going to meet with a case worker explain their story, and that caseworker then becomes access to all of the services from organizations to resources, money, manpower, material that's available to help uh, overcome that disaster. It also requires volunteers, of which there was no shortage. The challenge was how to manage such a large number. We had so many volunteers wanting to come help. It was finding the right avenue or finding proper jobs for them to do. That task fell to Bethany Community Church, which has coordinated the efforts of more than 13,000 volunteers. The supplies behind me, or a lot of them are, are either donated in kind or, or financial donations to our church, which set up a Trinidad Relief Fund uh, that we've purchased to help uh, have the right tools needed. And so we actually shut down most of the ministries of our church, at least for that first month or two, and focus primarily on sending volunteers out into the field. In some cases, the volunteers were literally in the field. We said, we need to hand rake this. And so we went out and bought, I think, 25 to 30 uh, flexible garden rakes that we would have on hand every, every time volunteers would come. But then we, uh, I decided let's buy a landscape rake to put on the back of the tractor and we bought a tractor, the New Holland tractor. We foamed the tires with insulation so it could run any place uh, because none of the farmers would want to come in with their vehicles because there's so many nails out there. And then we put the landscape rake on it and then we decided let's windrow it into rows. With the volunteers' help, they were able to plant 60 of their 75 acres in corn and beans. Other churches joined in the effort, including Grace Presbyterian Church of Peoria, which offered free carpentry for what is called Sheds of Hope. They contacted us and said, um, hey, we love to be able to build some sheds. And we said, well, we're kind of full with this whole volunteer management thing, but uh, if we can open up some space for you in our barn, feel free to come out and start building. And they did. Volunteers were plentiful in the immediate aftermath of the storm. As time progressed, the altruism may have faded for some, but others, like the Christian church in the Chicago suburb of Clarendon Hills, have made long-term commitments. This was the group's ninth trip to Washington. It's a good time to go because the farther away you get from something like that, the more people forget about it, and there's still a lot of need for it. So it was just the right time to, to come. There was another group that came earlier and um, put the shingles on the roof. See, I, I got that shed without shingles or um, siding so I could match the house. And I've got so many things to do that it's really helpful to have volunteers come. Don Hodel's new house on Gilman Avenue has a reminder of what has grown out of the carnage. It was offered to homeowners by Peoria Brick and Tile. Further up Gilman, different signs of strength pepper lawns as homeowners return to new houses in the old neighborhood. In the Trails Edge subdivision, despite not having moved back, neighbors continue to help neighbors through social media. We have shared information like, this is a really good thing, or this is what I learned, or 
this contractor is terrible, don't use them. You know, any, any kind of information like that has been, been put on the Facebook page, and so it's been really helpful. You know, I may not see my neighbors right now, but I'm still getting information from them via the Facebook page. It's been a very valuable tool. The Cronkies may have lost their house from the foundation up, but they did not lose important family papers because they were stored safely in the basement. Taking pictures or video of what's in your house, um, things like that, just so you have a record of it, just anything to jog your memory about things that you might need to replace. The Bohr family did not keep personal items in a safe place prior to the tornado. With a 16-year-old diabetic daughter in the household, such an oversight became a critical issue. We had no insulin. We had no um, emergency supplies for low blood sugars. We had no sight changes. We had, all she had was the immediate things, like she could check her blood sugar. Um, that's when we realized, you know what, we better have like a stash of not only diabetes supplies, but we're all asthmatics. We didn't have inhalers downstairs. I mean, I hadn't even thought of it. Um, so now we have our own little kit of emergency medical supplies, along with some water and some other things. Brian Young will use electronic technology to give his family more notice of impending storms. I've added an app to my phone that gives me earlier warnings. We bought a weather radio to keep in the house because my son has asked, what do we do if it happens in the night? While families have changed procedures, so have cities like East Peoria. I can recall going to the command center at the park district and we didn't have modern maps. Um, we didn't really have an established command center per se. And since then, uh, we, we've met and we said we, don't, we, we want to be more responsive. And in the future, we're going to have, we, we actually have a designated command center at the festival building. Uh, it's going to be, a, their generator will be ordered. Uh, we're putting stations for telephones and really looking uh, at, at a totally different concept in a command center. Those issues did not preclude the affected cities from monitoring neighborhoods that could be subjected to the whims of scrappers, scammers, and looters. We put police cars in every neighborhood at the entrances, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all the way through, must have been two, three weeks. The mayor made it very clear. Uh, he did not want these victims of this tornado to be victims all over, uh, again, from uh, scrappers, uh, contractors that uh, may not have uh, had uh, the victim's interest uh, at heart. We put signs up in the neighborhood that uh, any contractor had to be registered, and we would enforce that. And that was a good plan. Uh, some people didn't like that at first because they wanted certain people to come in their neighborhood and do that work. Initially, we kind of tried to register scrappers. But the problem was is they were told, you know, you can do anything on the roadway, you can do anything on the right of way, which is typically about 10 feet from the curb. But we had individuals that were going into, you know, into structures or into, you know, devastated areas and retrieving stuff that didn't that they weren't they didn't have a right to. We had curfews at night and we didn't have any looting. Uh, we were fortunate in that respect. The unstable air mass that spawned two Tazewell County tornadoes hovered over the southern two-thirds of Illinois that day, creating a dozen tornadoes that caused widespread power outages in the Ameren, Illinois Service Territory. In uh, East Pure and Pekin, you know, we had assigned crews there uh, to deal with the uh, restoration efforts. Obviously, the majority of our uh, workers were in the Washington area because that's where we had the most uh, devastation. We recognized early on the amount of uh, destruction that was uh, occurred to our facilities along Route 24. We had a lot of poles, a lot of conductors laying in the road uh, for the safety of our uh, of the public and for the safety of our crews doing a restoration effort. We felt it was necessary to shut the road down. So we worked with local officials uh, to shut the road down. It allowed us to work the uh, restoration efforts off the road versus uh, rough terrain. The folks from Ameren told us that had we not allowed them to do that, it probably would have been another week or better before they were able to get everything up because usually everybody's trying to work around each other. This way, by closing off for basically three days is what we did fully without letting anybody back in. It gave them an opportunity to run lines that they didn't have to worry about dodging traffic or anything else. Prior to the storm, some of our distribution systems were uh, in the right-of-ways behind people's homes, which uh, at some point in time makes it difficult to, to get to. 
uh, due to all the devastation, uh, we worked with the city and we were able to put the, uh, uh, our conductors in the ground in front of people's homes, which made it easier for us to uh, get to if we have outages in the future. We had about 150,000 customers out throughout our service territory, and we restored about 95% within the first 48 hours, and within three to four days, we had all the customers restored that could have power restored. Simply having power, uh, again, going back to what I said earlier, it, it, it was a victory. It was some semblance of normalcy within our community when everything was dark uh, for you know, several days. The restoration of electric service wasn't the only issue. As the storm ripped houses from their foundations, it tore natural gas lines open. Several gas personnel came in. We uh, closed some valves on some mains to uh, isolate the blowing gas. Then once we had all the gas isolated, then we started uh, with the repair to our gas system. The Red Cross was coming through the neighborhood um, in their disaster vehicles and checking with us, what do you need? handing out bottled water, handing out masks because of the, the fiberglass and the insulation and the smell of gas was so bad, you could just, it would, it would hurt your lungs. The cleanup expenses became a major source of contention. In some states, cities suffering a natural disaster would qualify for federal reimbursement for those costs. But Illinois is at a disadvantage because compensation is based on population. The more residents in a state, the higher the threshold. Mr. Wolner, our city manager, myself went and sat and presented our findings of how much money that we needed to recoup. And um, they went through page after page of the submittals that we had and basically told us that we were probably not going to be uh, eligible for FEMA funding because we didn't meet the threshold. The threshold is met by taking $1.35, multiplying it by the population of the state. We really feel that the federal law uh, that the FEMA follows needs uh, fundamental reform and improvement. Uh, it really is uh, unfair to large states like Illinois and other large states as well uh, that uh, have big cities in them, but also many rural areas. And the formula that FEMA has followed with respect to aid to municipalities and counties just isn't fair. And we've got to change that. As expected, on March 4th, 2014, the Federal Emergency Management Agency rejected the state's amended request for funding municipal expenses like debris cleanup. The state waited a single day to react. We're allocating $45 million uh, from our accounts, both our capital accounts and our emergency accounts, to make sure that we help Washington and East Peoria and uh, Pekin and Tazewell County and every part of Illinois that were hard hit by the tornadoes. While the state assisted communities, private citizens also needed financial aid. Organizations like the Salvation Army and the American Red Cross responded quickly backed by the donations of many. Some organizations chose to make material donations. One such company is Illinois-based The Pampered Chef. When this struck, it was devastating for our area. We've never seen anything like this happen before. And we have a strong customer base in the Tazewell County area, customers, consultants alike, and they lost everything. So we got together with the Pampered Chef and they put together basic boxes, basic essentials that would help people work, live out of a hotel room or whatever type of temporary housing they had. Local television and radio stations combined their personnel at the WTVP studio for a telethon that raised nearly a million dollars in one night to help fund Red Cross efforts. The Red Cross came in and was handing out gift cards right and left um, within days of when the tornado hit. The Salvation Army was giving out gift cards to go purchase clothes from their store. Obviously Red Cross and Salvation Army, they're trained to come in and do that. Uh, they were incredible. It was really nice to know that um, the Red Cross was there. Celebrities brought star power to the cause and also offered a helping hand. It really surprised me that, uh, you know, Ariel Speedwagon and Sticks in Chicago and uh, Jim Tomey, uh, the Blackhawks and uh, the Chicago Bears, 
uh, all kind of adopted Washington, Illinois. Bears owner George McCaskey came to Central Illinois to personally lend a hand at Five Points, Washington, which became a clearinghouse for many needs. After the tornado, Five Points, Washington was where everyone came at first. They came to find their loved ones. They came if they needed medical attention. They came to find answers. In the same building, the Washington District Library became a depository for lost items swept miles away in the storm. In a completely volunteer-driven project, individuals gather at the library to clean and then catalog cherished mementos, distinctive clothing, and photographs that have been turned in. Most items are scanned and placed in the library's website and then stored on several shelves at the library. The volunteers have learned there is meaning in nearly every item, no matter its condition. There was one photo that was partially torn. Uh, some of the faces were torn out of it, but uh, there was a child's face in that that was clearly visible. Um, turns out when the person came and got the photo that their child had passed away, and this was one of the few photos that they had of the child. But sometimes, fate takes a more direct route. For Glenn and Sally Williams, the tornado, seen here approaching their white-fenced house, took everything, including a cherished ring. After the twister had passed, the improbable occurred. This is my uh, grandmother's um, platinum wedding ring that she got married with, and her name was Sally. And I couldn't find this for, what, about a day and a half? And I just remember going to bed at night, um, praying and asking to please um, find this ring. And I was, my grandma has passed away, and I, I was just praying to her. And my husband had some, um, his workers, uh, some of his U.S. Marshal co-workers came for the day and, and helped us. Incredibly, they found the ring under debris in a curb down the street. The Williams home is being replaced. The same could not have been said for the ring. Sometimes, items that might have been sucked into the funnel of the storm stayed put because of an inexplicable change in routine. That was true for Allison Montgomery, who plays in the Peoria Symphony. For whatever reason that morning, I had, a, had my favorite viola laying on a love seat, and uh, I just grabbed it as we were running out to church, and I threw it in the case, and for whatever reason, I put all four violins in the corner of a room where I never put anything. And um, when I came home, I came down the hallway from the garage. Well, no, I came in through the dining room window. There was no garage. And when I looked over there, I saw my violins laying in that corner, held down by a piece of ceiling. Brian Young expected the worst when he emerged from his basement, trees having crashed through windows in his house. He was afraid another set of glass had been broken. My pride and joy, my uh, saltwater reef tank, you know, it's, it's the little things that you remember. I remember coming upstairs, looking in the kitchen, seeing the destruction, and I just kind of panned to my left to look in my foyer there, and sure enough, the tank was there. I th for sure was expecting all the coral and all the fish flopping on the floor, you know, with several hundred gallons spilled everywhere. Just minor stuff like that, you take that as a little win. Some losses are less emotional in nature, but nonetheless upsetting. When the Eureka Business Association learned of a problem many families were having with insurance coverage, a program called Springing Up Trees sprang to life. The association is providing a tree for at least 100 families. The Verdicts were the first family to enjoy their new tree, a replacement for two trees lost to the wind. Washington's very important to the community of Eureka, and we wanted to do something that we could uh, have a lasting impact on the people of the town. It was brought up that a lot of times trees aren't covered. Landscaping is iffy on your insurance. There was absolutely no tree coverage, so we paid out of pocket to get the trees removed. Victoria and I went to pick out the tree and we got an autumn maple. And the reason we got an autumn maple is we wanted one with colorful leaves. I like it, I can't wait for it to grow. And so as we are planting these trees in the community of Washington, we are putting tags on them of who donated them. If a person donates $200 or more, we're going, for every $200 donated, we're going to tag a tree with their name. This tree is tagged by a company in Peoria uh, for the benefit of someone who died 
uh, at that company in memory of him. For many homeowners, it's the lawn that needs attention. We're beginning to see the need for soil remediation, something that most of us probably wouldn't think of when we think of a tornado. We think of the rebuilding the house, rebuilding the school, but we don't think of the debris that's left behind and impaled in the earth and the fact that then the house is built, but the kids can't play in the yard or can't play in the park. And that need, frequently not covered by insurance, is pretty significant. I know all the neighbors are taking the top four inches of soil off of their yards and bringing in new topsoil and then either seeding or sodding. Um, so that's a process we still have to address. The insurance company would like us to just, what do they call it, power rake and vacuum the lawn, but um, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that from a safety issue. I think we probably need to do the scraping, so we're going to be asking them for, a, for safety reasons to pay for the scraping and bringing in the topsoil. One day we, we hope to have our kids be able to run through their lawns without any fear of anything sticking in their feet. On the turf at Babcook Field, the Panthers have traditionally been a football powerhouse. They were undefeated that fall, with a playoff game scheduled the Saturday after the tornado struck, which damaged or destroyed the homes of seven varsity players. You know, our, our first meeting that we had wasn't about football or anything. That uh, Tuesday when we got together was just trying to find out you know, who needs a place to stay, who needs clothes, you know, what can we do to help you guys out more than anything about the football game or anything that way. So if you ask any of those kids, it wasn't all the things they lost. The most important thing to them and put it at the clear forefront is their family and their friends. The fact that Coach said we're going to take time and work with the community um, speaks a lot about, about Daryl Crouch and, and his team. We had support from some unbelievable organizations that you wouldn't have thought. The, the Bears organization and the McCaskey family was huge. Brock Spack over at Illinois State. You know, we really had nowhere we could practice. We had no power, nowhere for our guys to shower. They let us come over there and practice. Uh, and then, like I said, those moms came in and fed us lunch and gave us food to come home with. Aishu was willing to wash our clothes. Eureka College, Kurt Barth, let us come over there because we had no power. Uh, you know, this is the first time in my whole coaching career where you coach a game and our kids never saw a film of who they were playing. I think our locker room was pretty close to status quo by that Saturday. I think football gave our guys a, a sense of normalcy in their lives, something they could at least be grounded. Even those guys that had lost their, you know, their homes or had their homes heavily damaged, it was at least the place where they felt comfortable and, and probably felt safe being here and, and being around their friends. The team lost the semifinal game in the playoffs to eventual state champion Sacred Heart Griffin, a team whose nickname is, ironically, the Cyclones. Uniforms of a different type, meanwhile, were patrolling the streets. I've been a policeman for 16 years. They always talk about thin blue line, brotherhood of the badge, all that type of stuff. Brown uniform, blue uniform, we're all brothers. Never realized it till then. It was amazing. There were people I've never met before that came over to help. And, and they didn't ask for anything. They didn't ask for pay. They didn't, they didn't want anything other than to help. Our guys were working 12 hour shifts every single day. They worked for a couple months without a day off. 12 hour days going through just all kinds of debris. Uh, we noticed that our boots were getting all cut up. It was then that Gordon received a call from a member of the police department in Plainfield with an offer of new boots. John said, you know what? Can you get all their sizes for us and the brands they prefer? And sure. So I got all the sizes and the brands. I sent all of that to John and it was amazing. He showed up for boots for every single member of this department. Plainfield, Illinois knew the need for boots firsthand. An EF-5 tornado in 1990 killed 28 people. Sirens at that time sounded after the tornado had touched ground. Tazewell County had only three fatalities as its sirens and more recent forms of communication notified citizens beforehand. But come test time the month after the storm in Washington, the sirens remained silent. 
instead of doing a monthly test with the tornado sirens like we do the first Tuesday of every month at 10 o'clock, you know, this happened in November. We didn't do one in December, January, February. It was March was the first time that we did a live siren test. Now we did silent tests to make sure all the sirens were in fact working, which they were. We did the silent test because we felt that, especially with school kids, younger school kids, it was a traumatic situation for a lot of people. I work night shifts, so I'd been sleeping, and um, the sirens went off. The siren is right down the street from us. After awakening, the Bohr family learned adjacent streets had been hit. They drove to Stone Ridge subdivision to offer help. My husband even um, took a gentleman, one of the gentlemen who passed away several weeks later, he was the one, um, he took him over in the back of our expedition as an ambulance because we couldn't get through to 911. Because we couldn't text, there was no phone, no 911. <clears throat> Um, it was a very surreal time, and we had no idea that it had gone further through town. All we knew was that it was the Stone Ridge, and right over there um, at the entrance of that newer subdivision. We had no idea until about two hours later that Gilman was gone. Across the street from Travis Maxwell's house, an entire neighborhood lay flattened. The storm had left his house standing, but certainly not functional takes all of the furniture out of the living room, right through the windows. But on the deck, it left a light gauge aluminum, you know, Home Depot type patio table with the chairs and the candles sitting on it. We had tree limbs lodged in walls. Um, I found it inside. Oh, yeah, yeah the, 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 the gentleman behind us had a really beautiful, large pine tree. And um, <laughs> I had part of his tree in my house, but that would make sense because it was doing this. It's just hard to, to believe what 30 or 40 seconds can do. No one has, you know, 25 sheets of plywood just sitting in the garage waiting for something to happen. So we took all of our interior doors and actually screwed them into the door jams or the window jams just to, on the main floor just to try to secure the home. I remember the first day um, that was one of the hardest for me was driving away. We think we successfully left with maybe 30% of everything we woke up with that morning. And looking at the neighbors, that is 30 more percent than a lot of them left with. So we're, we, we know we're, we're fortunate. Slightly more than four months later, the Maxwells moved back home, one of the first families to return to the neighborhood. The memory of the day they drove away had faded. It was March 28th, and at last, life was getting back to normal. For me, though, driving this morning and... Um, um, it kind of hit me that, hey, I'm, you know, I looked, had the pups in the car and, and I said, hey, we're going home. Many families displaced from their homes needed temporary housing, something many insurance policies do cover. Your policy does have some coverage for your um, out of the ordinary expenses, living expenses. So a lot of them had uh, money to be able to stay in a hotel, uh, to rent a place eventually. Not a lot of people have um, renter's insurance. We rent an apartment, and that, as soon as that happened, we got renter's insurance, because mm -hmm. you never know. People in a, in a renting situation, um, pretty much they buy the minimum amount, so I could see that would be an issue, because they tend to underestimate what the value of their contents might be. Now, there have been frustrations associated with uh, insurance. There have been frustrations as far as uh, different different uh, aspects of reconstruction, uh, the magnitude of, of, uh, of just things that they hadn't anticipated. People don't realize that it really takes a lot of money to rebuild or um, repair a home that's been substantially damaged. Um, if you just take a clean lot and you've got a nice clean build from scratch, that is so much less expensive than trying to rebuild on a, a damaged location. You have a lot of things go into that, your debris removal, um, and especially a partial build. You might have some ordinance issues now, um, some uh, upgrades to the home that need to be done now because of that. Because of the widespread impact of the tornadoes and the questions that arose, Winter Insurance is in the process of reviewing insurance policies with their clients. We've 
ask people to really take a hard look at their contents that they have around the home. Years ago, we used to give people a book to take and write an inventory and take that someplace like your safety deposit box and keep it. Well, now with technology, there are so many good ways for you to keep that information off site. So at the very least, you could go around with your cell phone and take some snapshots of a room because at a time of loss, when you're devastated, you're asked to recall what was in that room. Not only that, but what was in the storage box or what was in the hutch or what was, you know, all these nooks and crannies of your home that you have no idea what's in there, really. If you have specialty items in your home, like jewelry, guns, uh, valuable cameras, antiques, um, those should really be scheduled on the policy if you want them to have the full value coverage. Insurance policies vary widely, designed to meet the particular needs of a family. There may not be coverage for some items, like landscaping. Volunteerism often fills in the void left when a policy falls short. The churches here in Washington have been just phenomenal uh, with helping with the voluntary uh, needs that the community has. I think if someone wants to prepare for a disaster, it starts with relationships. And so we had um, some deep uh, seated relationships amongst uh, the churches here in our town, especially amongst the leaders and the pastors of those churches. It was that type of relationship that led to the establishment of Hope Swings in Washington, a program to supply swing sets to children. A youth group in Coral Gables, Florida, suggested the idea to Crossroads United Methodist Church. We contacted Home Depot, um, who were great after the tornado, and they, been, they helped us throughout the program. They kind of led us to um, the company that actually builds the whole um, swing set design, uh, Playstar up in Wisconsin, and, and they had some swing sets that they wanted, they wanted to kind of get rid of and we wanted to, to have, and so they, they set it up to give us a pretty good um, discount. Members of First United Methodist Church in Peoria and Evangelical United Methodist Church in Washington helped with the assembly. We had um, different groups from, youth groups from different churches in the United States, like that group from Coral Gables came up. Um, we had youth groups from Indiana, Minnesota, um, local ones from Peoria and Germantown Hills. Just each week we have 30 to 40 youth group kids who spend a week um, building swing sets. We'd deliver them and, and we would interact with the families and we'd watch kids swing and slide for the first times and, and some, of the, some of the parents literally said this is the first time that their son or daughter had smiled or laughed in months because of losing everything. Um, just the stress and the, the not understanding where their things are. Now they, they have something that's their own, their own swing set to play on and, and to have fun with. Stories of hope and survival are being archived at the Washington Historical Society. Written recollections from residents have been cataloged and filed so future generations can learn from these personal experiences. They involve the unexpected. As a 96-year-old recalled in her submission to the program called Hope Lives On. She was trapped in the debris and her neighbor came to get her and she couldn't walk across the debris. It was, I mean, her whole hospital was gone. And, and so he went back to his house, got a wheelbarrow, threw in the back and wheeled her um, to the nearest shelter. And she said that was just the ride of her life at 96 years old. It was the highlight for her. The tornado's financial impact on communities is fairly well documented. I think we've got an accurate picture of our EAV, our property tax. I mean, we know that 47% was impacted. Not entirely gone, but 47% is impacted. Five to six percent of that is my city budget. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the property tax goes to the school, so there's going to be a ripple effect. Joe Russell, uh, Cycling Fitness, uh, was down 30% uh, in December, which is usually one of his bigger months. Um, and January was probably 35 percent uh, is what he told me. You know, you hear a lot of talk about the economy and yeah, it is, it's kind of tough. Retail in general is not, not doing well. Uh, but yeah, we're doing, we're doing as, as good as I could expect after such a tragedy. Our budget goes from May 1 to May 1. So from April 30th of 2014 and back it up a year, we had a major flood where the river was at, at its highest, and that impacted us greatly, impacted our brand new wastewater treatment building. Um, 
we had that, we had the tornado, and then we had the snowstorms and the overtime and the salt and all of that to deal with. Washington's a pretty loyal town. I mean, uh, close-knit people, church community. And it's, they really have been good to us. And as soon as we opened the doors, it was like opening the floodgates. They all came in, first of all, make sure we were okay and give business back to us. So the impact was, was better than we you know, had expected. The human spirit is healthy in Tazewell County. Residents have demonstrated a resolute determination to overcome the worst that Mother Nature can serve. Two tornadoes on the eve of a brutal winter. The cleanup of debris, the building of houses, the planting of greenery, and the smiling faces are all signs of a strong community. The signs are everywhere. Hillcrest Golf Center reopened. Cambridge Estates is whole once again. Taylor and Nick will marry next May 23rd. Advance Auto Parts reopened. And Roger Giles is back at work. On that day, we found out that very quickly your life can go upside down. Very quickly. And uh, you better make, better make the most of every moment that you have. Now you count on your friends and, and family to be there to help you. The next thing we felt compelled to do is help. Our desire was to not only care for those within our church, but to care for our community. In the grand scheme of things, there's no way you could handle it without the support of the community. I think that's what makes Central Illinois, Central Illinois. That's what makes this town what it is. It was heartwarming to see people come from surrounding areas, surrounding states to come and, and to help us. There's a huge sense of community here that I don't know if we've lived anywhere else, we've lived all over the country, um, that we've felt this connected to the community. It's just amazing to me, and I'm so thankful that, that the day, day like today, and a time like now, that people are still that way. A day doesn't go by that I don't thank God for that I still have my kids. He turned to me and he says, there will never be a crop that you will be more attached to than this one, having crawled through the field on your knees. I think that gave them a little bit of a perspective of how much of a brotherhood that, you know, that really the football world is. I'm most proud of the way the community came together. The sense of family and community here is something that you just can't describe unless you live through it. It's, I don't ever want to live away. It really is amazing, uh, the, the, the fabric of this community. But I don't think anybody really realized the, the human spirit that was alive and well in Washington, Illinois, and continues to be so.
Support for November 17th, Finding Strength After the Storm, is provided in part by the following. Like many families, we lost our home in the tornado on November 17th. We've chosen to rebuild in Washington, a community that we love. I'm proud of my employer, Caterpillar, for its ongoing commitment to make Washington strong. Caterpillar is pleased to sponsor this program on public television. For nearly 80 years, CEFQ has been proud to call Central Illinois home. CEFQ members are your friends and neighbors, so when a tornado devastated our community last November, CEFQ was there to help members rebuild. Because together, we're better. A local expert who knows your unique situation makes all the difference. A country financial representative is nearby and ready to help with auto, home, life, health, and business insurance. Protect what matters most. The November 17th tornadoes shredded homes and lives. The American Red Cross immediately initiated a large-scale disaster relief effort in order to provide hope and comfort. And even as its emergency relief was occurring, the Red Cross began to help in the long recovery process that continues today. Four generations of Steegers, proud to be a part of the spirit of rebuilding and rebirth, and proud to provide affordable, fine furniture to Central Illinois. Here's to the future. From all of us at Steegers Furniture,